This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 52. Coming up on Space Time, a new window on matter. The SKA project to get the world's most powerful ever supercomputers. And New Zealand's latest orbital space flight. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. New research suggests the detection of merging neutron stars could provide scientists with new insights into the fundamental properties of matter. The discovery in 2017 of gravitational waves generated by two merging neutron stars is offering scientists a chance to look in the future at least to answering some fundamental questions about the structure of matter. Scientists hypothesize that the extremely high temperatures and densities in such mergers produce a phase transition where neutrons are dissolved into their constituent quarks and gluons. Now, two research groups reporting in the journal Physical Review Letters have detailed their calculations of exactly what the signature of such a phase transition in a gravitational wave could look like. Quarks are the smallest building blocks of matter, and as we discussed last week, they never appear alone in nature. Instead, they're always found in groups of two in mesons and groups of three inside protons and neutrons. However, neutron stars, which have as much mass as the Sun, confined into just a 12-kilometer wide diameter, contain a core that must be so dense that a transition from neutron matter to quark matter could be occurring. Physicists refer to this process as phase transition. It's exactly the same as what happens when water ice becomes a liquid or liquid water becomes a vapor. But in the heart of a neutron star, these are extreme phase transitions, only possible when merging neutron stars form a very massive metastable object with densities exceeding that of atomic nuclei and with pressures 10,000 times higher than the core of the Sun. The researchers believe that measurements of gravitational waves emitted by merging neutron stars could serve as a messenger of possible phase transition events inside the neutron star. And these phase transitions should leave a characteristic signature in the gravitational wave signal. The two research groups used supercomputers to calculate what this signature would look like. Each group used a different theoretical model of the phase transition. Now, if the phase transition takes place sometime after the actual merger, small amounts of quarks should gradually appear throughout the merged object. One of the study's authors, Professor Luciano Rosolo from Goethe University, used Albert Einstein's equations to show for the first time that this subtle change in the structure will produce a deviation in the gravitational wave signal until the newly formed massive neutron star collapses under its own weight to form a black hole. The other set of computer simulations looked at the phase transition occurring as the two neutron stars actually merged. This would result in the formation of a core of quark matter in the interior of the central object. The study's co-author, Dr. Andreas Balswein from GCI Helmholtz Zentrum für Schwererhornung Verschung in Darmstadt, Germany, says their calculations show that in this case, there would be a distinct shift in the frequency of the gravitational wave signal, resulting in a measurable criterion for identifying phase transitions in the gravitational waves of the merging neutron stars. While existing gravitational wave detectors can't yet pick up and measure the signal unless the source is relatively close, new upgrades now underway should resolve this problem. Meanwhile, a complementary approach to study quark matter is also being developed at GSI, where the existing Hades Collider is smashing heavy ions together, and the new CBM detector is now being built, where compressed nuclear matter will be produced. In these collisions, it might just be possible to create the sorts of temperatures and densities which are similar to those in a neutron star merger. Both methods would give new insights into the occurrence of phase transitions in nuclear matter, and thus into its fundamental properties. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. The Giant Square Kilometre Array Project, which is building the world's biggest telescope in Western Australia and Southern Africa, has finally completed design work on what will be the world's most powerful supercomputer needed to power the massive observatory. The SKA Science Data Processor, or SDP, will be composed of two supercomputers, one located in the Western Australian capital of Perth, the other in Cape Town, South Africa. They'll be the brains of the SKA, needed to process the enormous amounts of data produced by the array's thousands of telescopes. 
Design of the new computer was led by the University of Cambridge as part of an international consortium comprising 40 institutions from 11 countries. The SDP will be the second stage of processing for the masses of digitised astronomical signals collected by the telescope's many receivers, and it will follow the initial correlation and beamforming that takes place at the Central Signals Processor, or CSP. Scientists estimate the SDP's total computing power will be around 250 petaflops. That's some 25% faster than IBM's Summit, currently the fastest supercomputer in the world. In total, around 600 petabytes of data will be distributed around the world each year from the SDP, enough to fill more than a million laptops. Additionally, because of the sheer quantity of data flowing into the SDP, some 5 terabytes per second, or 100,000 times faster than the projected global average broadband speed in 2022, the SDP will need to make decisions on its own in almost real time about what's noise and what's worthwhile data to keep. To find out more, Andrew Dunkley is speaking with astronomer Dr. Fred Watson. The square kilometre array, the latest news on that is the supercomputer that they're planning to create to kind of crunch all this data they're going to collect. And from all reports, this is going to be one mega, mega device. I mean, it'll, you know, it'll far outweigh anything that's ever been created before. That's absolutely right. The really interesting thing, I think, right from the beginning of the Square Kilometre Array project has been that the amount of data that it will produce has always been thought to be greater than the capabilities of data analysis hardware and software at the present time, whatever the present time happens to be. And that's still the case. The amount of data that it will produce, its colossal number of petabytes, has always been regarded as a, you know, one of the future challenges. Of the Square Kilometre Array was to produce the data analysis hardware and software. And the reason why we're talking about this is because the design has now been completed for something called the SDP, which is the Science Data Processor for the Square Kilometre Array. And the bottom line is that it will be the fastest in the world. It will beat every other fast computer hands down. So it's 600 petabytes of data every year, and you divide that by 365 to work out what it is in a day. It's a lot. And a petabyte, of course, is a thousand terabytes, and a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes. So you're talking a million gigabytes there. They're mind-boggling numbers, and they've always been mind-boggling numbers. And I guess it's only now, something like the 10th year of the SKA project, that we're starting to really come to terms with it, with the design of the SDP, the Science Data Processing Center. And it, it's great to see this. I think this has been regarded as something of a triumph because you can have blue sky ideas and say, oh, yes, the technology will catch up. That's all very fine. But to actually design the technology before it's caught up, I think that's pretty impressive. That's Professor Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Rocket Labs has successfully carried out its seventh orbital mission in a spectacular late afternoon launch. The company's 17-metre-tall two-stage electron rocket blasted off from Launch Complex 1 on New Zealand's Mahea Peninsula, carrying seven small satellites into orbit. Stage 1 flight on mission. Flight Stage 1. Please confirm Stage 1 is pressed. Stage 1 is pressed. High flying approach. Stage 2 flight mission. Flight Stage 2. Please confirm Stage 2 is pressed. Stage 2 is pressed. Commanding deluge on. Gallage running. Ready engine, C systems. Re readying engines. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Ignition. 2, 1. Lift off, make us get the bed. And we have liftoff of the Make It Rain mission on Electron. Shortly, the vehicle will come up against max Q or maximum aerodynamic pressure, where the forces against Electron will hit their peak. IP Dragon downrange. Coming up on maximum dynamic pressure. Stage 1 propulsion remains nominal. Shortly, Electron will go through a series of major milestones in quick succession. Starting with main engine cutoff, or MECO, the nine Rutherford engines on Electron's first hey, stage will shut down in preparation for our first of two separations. Following the separation of Electron's first and second stages, we'll see ignition of the vacuum-optimized Rutherford engine on Electron's second stage. Electron's second stage, carrying the kick stage and its payloads, will then continue onto an elliptical orbit. Power pack CO2 succeeded. Entering stage one burnout detect mode. Stage one Miko. Stage separation succeeded. We have had main engine cutoff. 
Electron's first and second stages have successfully separated from each other, and the Rusker engine on Electron's second stage has ignited. And there goes the fairing. The fairing protects the payloads on the way to orbit, but once we're out of the thicker parts of the atmosphere, we don't really need it anymore. It's just been successfully jettisoned to make way for payload deployment approximately 51 minutes from now. Trajectory remains nominal. Stage 2 propulsion remains nominal. So we're now at T plus 5 minutes and 45 seconds after liftoff. The next major milestone Vehicles coming up the is the hot swap of the batteries. The Rutherford engines replace traditional gas turbo pumps with electric ones powered by batteries. Once these batteries have depleted of energy, they're really just dead weight. So to solve this problem, we perform a hot swap where we transfer power over from the depleted batteries to another fully charged one, and this provides a much more efficient ride to orbit. Coming up on HV battery hot swap. HV battery eject succeeded. Stage 2 propulsion is nominal and our trajectory continues to look good. Entering stage 2 burnout detect mode. Stage 2 engine cutoff. Transfer orbit is nominal. Into stage 2 operating. Confirmation that the kick stage has separated from Electron in the lead up to payload deployment. In around 45 minutes time, Maker Rain's payloads will be deployed individually from the kick stage at predetermined Security. intervals. Some 56 minutes after launch at an altitude of 450 kilometers, the Electron's Curry kick stage successfully began deploying at 7 satellite payloads into their respective orbits. The payloads included the Black Sky Global 3 Commercial Earth Observation Satellite, two U.S. Department of Defense Special Operations Command Prometheus CubeSats, a pair of Swarm Technology Space Speed Data Relay CubeSats, the University of Melbourne's ACRUX-1 CubeSat, as well as a mysteriously classified payload for an equally mysteriously undisclosed client. The mission was the third Electron launch this year. Rocket Lab now expects to begin undertaking regular commercial orbital flights every month. And that busy schedule is expected to double when the company begins launching flights from its new Wallops Island launch facility on the Virginia Mid-Atlantic coast later this year. The University of Sydney rocketry team has won its category in the Spaceport America Cup in New Mexico. The competition pits competitors from around the world, launching a mixture of solid, liquid and hybrid rockets to target altitudes of either 10,000 or 30,000 feet. The Sydney Uni students won their event by defeating 51 other teams from around the world in the intercollegiate competition. Their rocket, named SilverEye, reached an altitude of over 3 kilometres or 100,000 feet using only commercially available off-the-shelf equipment. That's one of the rules of the competition, by the way. Silver Eye was constructed using a carbon fiber airframe and solid fuel propellant, achieving speeds approaching the speed of sound. It was the first time an Australian team had competed in the annual event. The team also received an honorable mention for their sportsmanship, using their expertise to assist other teams launching and recovering their rockets. Meanwhile, students from Monash University in Melbourne have finished ninth out of 36 teams from 10 countries, competing in this year's University Rover Challenge. The competition is designed to test university students. They need to build an operational space rover using a budget of no more than 18,000 US dollars. The rover needs to perform the same tasks as a multi-million dollar Mars rover does. The annual competition was held at the Mars Desert Research Station in Hanksville, Utah, and it was won this year by the Impulse team from Karls University in Poland. Monash's Nova Rover team consisted of 33 engineering and science students. We're a multidisciplinary student team based at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Since the 2018 URC, we have expanded our team to 33 members covering chassis, electrical, arm, software, science, logistics and communications subteams. All of our members have been hard at work designing a lighter, smarter rover to compete in the 2019 competition. The 2019 rover features a new custom suspension system designed in-house by the chassis team. The focus was to ensure that the rover would maintain control over its position at all times over any of the anticipated terrain. In order to achieve this, we designed a custom bogey system which allows each of the six wheels to move independently with respect to the frame. The flexible design provides even weight distribution and ensures all six drive wheels maintain contact with the ground at all times. The large footprint six wheel design paired with a low center of gravity provides excellent stability and control on any incline. We designed a modular frame with common drive wheel units to allow us to quickly and easily replace any of the six units with a common spare. Our new Rover custom six-wheeled suspension system and frame has provided a highly controllable and stable platform for our 2019 rover. Building upon the previous mission success of the Endeavour scientific payload and experimental portion of the 2018 science case task, we are looking to integrate a suite of in-situ biochemical life detection assays and innovative mechanical systems into this year's Sagan scientific payload. Over the past two years, we've explored a range of manufacturing methods to develop a custom drill that meets the demands of the science team and limitations of the rover. Adapting to this year's 
new rule set, we have developed a novel soil processing and analysis unit that extracts organics from soil samples and uses spectrophotometry to search for biosignatures. Sagan will therefore have the capability to search for the presence of lipids, proteins, and enzyme activity as a proxy for cellular viability and therefore the presence or absence of life. Following from our experience in last year's competition, we have drastically increased the overall quality of parts with advanced fabrication techniques in the arm sub-assembly system, allowing for better rigidity and management of stress concentrations. The new construction of the arm linkages lowers weight and increases the range of motion of the arm. Belt drives are used to reduce motor backlash and 24 volt linear actuators provide robust lifting force. The N effector has been redesigned to better grasp three dimensional objects. The spring loaded fingers provide an encompassing grip on the variety of shapes required. This year we've completely redesigned the electrical system with the aim of making every subsystem as efficient and reliable as possible. We've changed our approach to battery management, incorporating voltage, current, and temperature monitoring and a safety shutdown switch into a single modular unit. The drive motors are controlled by six high performance Talon SRXs utilizing their advanced onboard PID algorithms. Our various subsystems communicate via CAN bus, which is a tough, fast and reliable communication protocol originally designed for automotive applications. We've designed and built our own custom PCBs, including seven motor drivers for the arm, with onboard microcontrollers enabling tight feedback loops and in-situ diagnostics. The brain of the system is the NVIDIA Jetson TX2, a versatile computer powered by NVIDIA's Pascal architecture, with powerful integrated deep learning capabilities and a platform purpose-built for AI tasks like computer vision and autonomous navigation. This year, software team have focused our efforts on addressing the shortfalls of last year's software system. To allow for faster debugging and software development overall, we have begun using the WeBot simulator to test our code independently from the actual physical rover. And our new control center GUI will allow us to see the status of the rover and all peripherals attached, such as sensors, camera, feeds, and radio connectivity. Our primary navigation camera is a dual lens 180 degree field of view camera, viewable through a VHA headset, which provides depth perception to the driver and is important for spotting obstacles that might otherwise trip up the rover. We've also changed the semi-directional base station antennas, which will improve signal strength and we will also be employing both a more reliable 900 megahertz radio system as well as a higher bandwidth 5 megahertz system. Behind the scenes of all of these systems are state machines, which manage the status of all parts of the software stack so that the rover is able to adapt to its behavior to whatever conditions it is currently experiencing. For example, switching states from traverse during the autonomous task to avoid when detecting an obstacle to search when the rover has reached its destination. Path planning is calculated based on real height map data to avoid any extreme slates. And to detect the tennis ball, we have developed and trained our own neural network that has 23 convolution and two detection layers. These will enable the network to detect the tennis ball regardless of distance or environmental interferences. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. An Italian study has found that living in an area with high air pollution may be linked to having lower levels of a female fertility marker. The research, which is yet to be peer-reviewed, is being presented to the European Society for Human Reproduction and Embryology Conference. The authors looked at levels of anti-malarium hormone in more than 1,300 women, using the hormone as a marker for ovarian reserve or female fertility. They found that while a female's age was still the strongest predictor of hormone levels, there was also a strong link between hormone levels and levels of environmental pollutants. Well, as the world gears up to celebrate 50 years since humans first set foot on the moon, new research has shed fresh light on what space radiation can do to the human body when we send astronauts off into the cosmos. Analyzing the health records of all Russian and American astronauts since 1959, researchers found increased exposure to ionizing radiation in space doesn't appear to place astronauts at any higher risk of cancer or heart disease. However, the findings published in the journal Scientific Reports did warn that future missions may carry a higher risk as they're likely to expose crews to higher doses of radiation from space as they undertake longer distance missions to the Moon, Mars and beyond. Paleontologists have discovered that not all crocodiles from the age of dinosaurs were meat-eating killers. A report in the journal Current Biology claims that some members of the crocodilian family at the time were likely dining exclusively on plants. Scientists reached their conclusions by comparing the teeth of extinct crocodile relatives to those of today's snappers. Researchers found a wide range of tooth shapes in ancient crocs, suggesting they were able to eat a wide variety of diets and they found that vegetarian crocodiles probably evolved at least three times, and may have evolved up to six times during the Mesozoic era. 
It's been revealed that the apps you regularly use to log your steps, edit your photos, and monitor your finances may be hiding malicious software that could be tracking and even stealing your personal information. The findings, reported in the Proceedings of the World Wide Web Conference 2019, were part of a two-year cybersecurity project by researchers from the University of Sydney and Data61 CSIRO. They investigated more than a million Google Play apps and discovered more than 2,040 potential counterfeit apps. Many of the fake apps impersonated highly popular apps and contained malware, with popular games such as Temple Run, Free Flow and Hill Climb Racing being the most commonly counterfeited. The study also found that several counterfeit apps requested dangerous data access permissions despite not containing any known malware. New researchers discovered that employees who view pornography while at work aren't just costing their companies millions of dollars in wasted time, they're also causing real harm to the company. The study, reported in the Journal of Business Ethics, found that viewing pornography at work increases unethical behaviour. Now, given that unethical employee behaviour is linked to a number of negative organisational outcomes like fraud and collusion, employee pornography consumption is therefore really putting organisations at risk. The study included an experiment with 200 participants and a nationally representative survey of a 1,000 other individuals. In the experiment, one group were tasked with recalling and recording their last experience viewing pornography. Meanwhile, members of the control group were asked to recall and record their most recent experience exercising. Both groups were then asked to watch the entirety of a boring 10-minute video consisting of a blue background with a monotone voice speaking with subtitles. Researchers found 21% of those who recalled their last experience viewing porn didn't finish watching the video but lied about it, while only 8% of those in the control group didn't finish watching the video and lied about it. This represented a statistically significant 163% increase in shirking work and lying for those who had viewed pornography. Oh, hard to believe I know, but a new study has found that almost 9 out of 10 Australians really do believe in ghosts. Mind you, the study was commissioned by the Sci-Fi Channel to promote a new show, and so its scientific credibility can't be guaranteed. But it does contain some interesting fun claims. As well as 88% of Aussies believing the paranormal, half believe they've actually had a brush with ghosts or spirits. And I don't mean the drinking kind. 42% believe in UFOs, in this case flying saucers, aliens having visited Earth. 41% believe in premonitions, and 36% believe in communicating with the dead and with angels. To mull over the details, we're joined by Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. This is a story that came out recently, probably some of all places, um, a bit of homes and garden. It doesn't seem like your average sort of ghost promoting no, no. Uh, site at all. And it says things like so many people believe in ghosts in Australia. It then goes on to suggest that maybe there's a reason why people see ghosts and its reason it puts forward is mould. Oh, now, so mould on your wall. Stoned. They're getting stoned. Yeah, basically. The story is actually put out by a cleaning company, which makes you think, oh, okay, <laughs> perhaps they know something about mould or perhaps they're just trying to promote their services. But it that does actually pull in a lot of interesting stuff that some people have been trying to find a link between the paranormal, belief in the paranormal, witnessing paranormal, and mold or fungus. There's various types of fungus that are known to cause um, psychedelic effects and psychotropic effects, I think it is. Yeah, magic, um, mushrooms. magic mushrooms. Yeah, but this is sort of just the standard mold you see in your bathroom or on your walls, etc. And it's causing people to have various respiratory problems, obviously, skin issues, tiredness, nausea, those sort of yeah, poisoning effects. But it also feels it might have this like psychedelic or psychological effect. This has been something that people have been researching actually for a while, not necessarily coming to any firm conclusions, but way back, I think about 30 years ago, someone was actually suggesting something called sick library effect, which is basically all the little sort of bugs and things that you find in old books. You start reading old books and you start getting some sort of illnesses, etc., or maybe even a, a you know, respiratory illnesses, various things. It was picked up later on as sick building syndrome, and then more specifically, some researchers in the US have been, over a number of years, have been looking at this effect and what it might mean for the, the paranormal and ghost hauntings etc and they have found sort of it's not it's not definite by any means but they sort of think they found some sort of relationship between people who have paranormal events and and have mold because you go to a haunted house and it's been locked up for ages like it's dusty it's no doubt it has mold and dampness and those sort of issues so the people see ghosts in those sort of environments if the mold theory works as a, as a toxic problem etc then that's the place to get it but it's still to be proven but it's an interesting interesting idea. It probably wouldn't prove every example of ghost sightings, etc. by a long shot, but in some circumstances, if it's true, it's quite an interesting phenomenon. And that's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. 
You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 